Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. Uh, I'm the faculty co-director of the Storage, Storage X Initiative. It's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to today's uh, Storage X seminar. So today we are delighted um, to host two speakers, uh, Professor Dan Kamen from UC Berkeley and Professor Megan Motter from Stanford. So let me briefly introduce Dan. Uh, Dan is a a uh, distinguished faculty from uh, UC Berkeley, and he has trained many of the world leaders today on energy technology um, and policy. And I just want to briefly highlight Dan's contribution on his service um, to the country and to the world. Uh, not only is a world expert on decarbonization and sustainability, uh, he's also serving many roles. Uh, for example, as the senior advisor for energy innovation at USAID. Uh, he is also the coordinating author for the IPCC, which received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. And he also has served as the science envoy under Secretary of State John Kerry. So Dan, we're really, really delighted to have you today. Uh, it's an honor and we're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, thanks to the audience and to the, really the whole Stanford team. And as a as a short term Stanford graduate student, I feel a little connection and uh, pride in what you guys are doing. But I admit I am teaching across the bay. And for, the, for those who maintain the Stanford Berkeley rivalry, I'm certainly the other side of the friendly partnership. But I was a PhD student uh, in physics actually at Stanford. So there's there's several things that I'm going to try to um, encompass together in, in in my comments here, um, and really the overarching one is the one that William already highlighted. That um, I won't be quite technology agnostic, I have to admit, but I'll really try to highlight um, different ways that storage is not only um, evolving and, and innovating on the chemical or potential energy um, or, or fuels side, um, fuels being hydrogen, as well as applications that range from large utility scale grids, parts of the United States, China, um, but specifically also what sometimes gets forgotten, and that is the energy access, and in particular, as I'll see later on, the health access part of the story. So this will be a more wide-ranging version. The, the chemistry and physics of some of the storage systems, well, you'll see them in some of the references and papers, but I'm going to really focus on systems thinking. And so anybody who wants either to access the materials, both the technical papers, um, some of the interviews, we just did a big series um, on CNN and then in The Guardian, and you can find that on the website of my laboratory, that's at the top, that's RAIL, the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory, and then the uh, the, the tweet uh, feed at the bottom is not uh, my own individual things, that's uh, generally images, um, comments from myself and the laboratory team, but we use my name to tag them, so it's Dan underscore Kamen. And as we think about sort of these these projects, just giving you a shout, giving a shout out to my uh, university team. Um, this, these are all students, both graduate students and undergraduates in my laboratory, and it gives you a feeling for the kind of places we work. Um, just to highlight, because you'll hear the names later on a little bit, Bemi Akinsipe is actually on leave working for the United Nations. She's working in the vice president of Nigeria's office on their decarbonization plan. John um, Aru is a South Sudanese energy researcher, and actually I was in South Sudan last week, and you'll see some, some energy storages. Alexander Grayson, um, Annalise Gilwile, and Jess Kersey are all PhD students in my lab working on different aspects of either um, onshore um, storage deployment, electric vehicles in one case, another case hydrogen, another case integration with the offshore wind industry. Jasmine McAdams is working on energy justice. Sam McAdam, um, Sam Miles is working on energy, clean energy for clinics, um, particularly in the Congo. Um, Nadilla Rasoliani, a visiting graduate student from the University of Indonesia, a country that just um, signed a major clean energy decarbonization pact with uh, US, UK, and German governments. Lynn Shio is a, a graduate student from Kenya. Stephen Stack from Ireland, Hillary Yu is actually long term living in the field in Eastern Congo. And then uh, uh, Sune um, Dagli, Irma Duran, and Brooke Sobrian um, are all working on different aspects of materials decarbonization and materials science. So there's going to be the range of people involved in this project. 
And I don't think anyone needs um, on this call to really see again or be reminded of the, the generic picture of the historical emissions, the black we are, um, we have done, the range of current policies that if we did them all, that is a massive if, would uh, only hold us into the two to three degree C range, an unacceptably high uh, range. The commitments that countries have made up through COP27 um, in Sharm el Sheikh uh, would limit it to about two and a half degrees. And then various pledges and targets would bring us down somewhat. Um, the optimistic pathway really gets us to only 1.8, and that's if everything goes right. And so far, I would say almost nothing has gone right. And then the pathway that we endorsed at the IPCC is the 1.5. And of course, that involves carbon negative strategies are now unfortunately a must because we waited so long. So that's the context. And what that means, of course, in practice is that all economies need to decarbonize. And I think people on the call will certainly disagree with me on this one, but to my calculations, which are pretty extensive, that means that any investment in gas going forward, any investment in gas is a risky and in many cases unwarranted investment. Um, and that's largely because of the massive progress that's been made on clean energy and energy storage. And of course, unpacking that statement will reveal all our political views and differences, but it's important to state that when we think about the massive exploration efforts um, in Africa by US and European com com companies and Chinese companies, the efforts for gas in Southeast Asia, these as profitable as they may sound and as much as people want to argue that these will be turned off in some organized manner, um, that we capture. Um, this is really a, a, a very, very bad bet. You would not make that bet if it was your health care um, that we're talking about. But somehow in an energy world where most of us my age and older will not be around to see all of the worst of the damages, it is a really problematic decision, but it's one that we are making. Again, just to reemphasize the story, we've been having these meetings now. I have been to 17 of the COP meetings. Um, of the 27, probably not proud of, and the climate change has continued because we've talked a great deal, but we have not done a great deal, which is really why this moment of speed and scale is so critical. The last piece of framing that you'll see coming back in multiple times here is the one that for many of us is the most uncomfortable, and that is the richest 1% of people on the planet contribute directly to 15% of emissions. And the richest 10% contribute over half of global emissions, rich in the US, rich in Ghana, rich in South Sudan, rich in Nigeria, Japan, South Africa, China, et cetera. The poorest half of humanity contribute less than 7%. And that's really the place where if you are gonna put fossil fuel investment in place before we think about the decarbonization of the storage pathway, that's where it needs to go. The problem is, that when we make that argument and install these fossil fuel systems, generally the poor don't access them anyway. It's generally for industry, um, whether it's in South Africa or Southern California, that could probably afford to be on the leading edge anyway. Again, those are kind of complex words in terms of the politics. Jumping to the world that I feel a little more comfortable in, however, um, one of the tools that my laboratory has built to enable this conversation is an open source model called SWITCH, roughly stands for solar and wind uh, transmission integrated with conventional power. SWITCH, um, you see the website here, just Google my name, Berkeley SWITCH, it'll come up. And this is a now um, 10 year long project to build open source and open access models of power systems. Um, in the vernacular, these are capacity expansion models, meaning looking from the power system in a given country or region going forward. And what we do is to minimize the net present value of the sum of all of the assets. And by assets, what I mean are the capital cost and the operational cost of existing plants, both thermal and renewable projects. Um, we generally have a um, a reserve margin, you can see in the second line here, reserve margin for some places is as large as 15%, um, in other places as small as 4 or 5%, um, and all capacity not used directly, we used to spill. Um, now, thankfully, our equation of state is energy is equal to energy used directly plus energy stored, 
And so we can either allocate energy resources to, to directly operate the energy system or to put it into storage. Um, you can see um, the spill factor, which nowadays we can send to zero because we can capture it all if we have enough storage installed. This modeling also models the cost and the time to build new transmission lines, technologies that are very slow to build, such as nuclear plants or DC transmission, and those that are very rapid to do, such as lithium ion, lithium phosphate batteries, um, solar renewable energy assets. We also price in some energy efficiency um, maneuver uh, operations and maneuvers, but we won't get into that one today. So far, the switch model has been built and deployed in Western North America. We started with California, but we've modeled the whole WEC region, the Western Electricity Coordinating Council. We have switch for Mexico, for Nicaragua, for Chile, um, for the whole East African power pool, although we have a focus on Kenya, um, Uganda, and Tanzania. Um, the India version is not actually one that my laboratory is working on, a uh, former graduate student um, who is at Professor UC Santa Barbara works on that. And then our biggest team is working on the China version. Um, in Japan, I should have colored in, we released the, the Japan switch model last year. The ranges of partners are the ones that you'd expect when you build a modeling tool like this. We don't do it if we do not have a, um, a clear partner inside the national government. And so Ministry of the uh, Ministry of Mines, uh, Ministry of Environment will always be a partner. A number of businesses, some that are Bay Area based um, and some that are local. Cube is a mini grid company in Norway that installs in East Africa. Virunga Power is the micro hydro energy company spun out of Virunga National Park. Um, Africa's oldest national park. Natel Energy is a Bay Area company that is micro hydro, a number of energy councils, just to get, give you a feeling of the range of the projects we do. As we think about pathways, um, essentially, if you, can if you can dream it up and it makes some technical sense, we can build it. So Sunshot was the US program to get solar uh, lower than a dollar a watt for large commercial systems and dollar fifty a watt for small systems. That's a, a goal that has been achieved. We have scenarios with low cost batteries. That'll be the one I'll highlight here. Um, but we also look at those where nuclear plays a large role, where CCS works at scale, where we take into account the methane leakage that we observe. Um, from actual gas fields and pipelines where transmission costs are high and low, where we zero out or limit the amount of, of hydro due to environmental regions such as in California. But it gives you a feeling for the types of scenarios. And the outputs for all these models, this is kind of a typical, this one is actually for Western North America. Um, so the black line is the demand for energy in 2050, consistent with a 1.5 degree scenario. And the colors I hope make sense. Light blue is wind, yellow is solar, um, dark blue is hydro, gas with capture is this green color. And the most interesting one for us today is the orange is energy uh, released from storage, the solid orange here, and the negative going spikes below are energy going into storage. And it's really that landscape that um, we'll talk about as we go forward here. I think the most interesting feature is that we initially built this model to think largely about solar deployment to meet some of California's zero carbon um, numbers back um, in 2012, 2013, but increasingly we moved into storage. And so one of the big initial successes of using the switch model was that we had a sit down with all three California IOU utilities. Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric, as well as the regulator, the Public Utilities Commission, and we built a version of the model that was aggressive on the storage side. That dialogue and the publicly released aspects of our model led to a requirement passed by the California legislator in 2014 that by 2020, 2% of California's peak demand would be met by new storage that did not exist at that point in 2014. In other words, compressed air and pumped hydro were excluded from that analysis. 2% of California's peak demand, peak demand is about 50 gigawatts. Um, so we're talking on the order of 4% of that um, that was required. And interestingly enough, California 
basically met that target. It was a target for 2020, but we've now seen individual facilities. Um, in Central California, we have one facility which is equal to about 1.3% of our total uh, of our total peak demand. And just to put it in context, in um, one facility recently opened uh, 2021 in China was almost a gigawatt uh, hour of capacity. Now I've been a little loose here, as you'll notice, between kilowatts and kilowatt hours, or gigawatts and gigawatt hours, and that's because. To really get the utilities comfortable with this in the beginning, almost 10 years ago, we talked about peak capacity. Now, of course, all of these assessments, whether it's here in California, whether it's the analysis going on at National Grid in the UK, or whether it's some of the uh, PJM, the US East Coast analysis, are thankfully, we've moved to the proper units at least, uh, kilowatt, um, kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, gigawatt hours. In terms of thinking through how much capacity we're going to need, you're going to get a range of answers depending on who you ask. Some work that we've done with Imperial College specific to the UK situation because they are ahead of us in terms of deploying in particular offshore wind and storage. And you can see that as you want to uh, get to uh, very close to 100% clean energy, the amount of storage ramped up uh, really dramatically. And so roughly, again, this is an area of kind of fighting words, depending if you are a, uh, a storage only maven or if you're a storage plus nuclear or hydro person. We've, we frequently find scenarios coming out of models like switch that call for between 60 and over 100% of peak generation capacity will be needed in times of storage. We in um, in, in the Bay Area just had, um, for some of us, had two days of blackouts. Um, but back in August, we had a point of in early September, we had this massive heat wave where um, it was touch and go whether the grid would uh, would support it. And California hit its peak demand levels, 50, 51 gigawatts. Um, the grid did not go down, largely due to the amount of distributed clean energy and storage um, and, and that's available in the system. I think I won't play with some of the simulation plots where we look at the amount of storage and which technologies are likely to win out over time. Um, there's in this mix, there's pumped hydro, compressed air, lithium ion, vanadium flow batteries, uh, flywheels, and hydrogen. And we do a lot of work to look at what will what mixture we will need basically learning curves, the cost declines of different technologies. But I'm really just showing this to show off a little bit about some of the, the images we do. So we'll skip over that um, and really think system wide. So California has really two key things. One is the set of storage mandates that I mentioned, but the other one is that California requires um, that we get to carbon neutrality. Right now, the letter of the law says we must be carbon neutral the entire economy, not just the energy sector, by 2045. Um, by 2030, we need to be 60% powered by renewables, which ramps up the amount of storage. And I think most interestingly, California was the first place to write environmental justice into its cap and trade requirements. 35% of California's cap and trade revenues that currently are 11 to $12 billion a year must be spent on underserved and marginalized and fence line communities. And you probably know that um, then vice president and candidate for presidency uh, Biden um, did us 5% better and announced Justice 40 that calls for 40% of uh, federal infrastructure spending to be for underserved marginalized communities. Um, and in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, the single largest allocation of money, $60 billion, is for clean energy projects, energy transition, employment projects um, to the, that address the, the, the systemic and long um, and longstanding discrimination and marginalization of, of underserved communities, communities of color, uh, women. And so it's a really remarkable push, and it needs to play a bigger and more prominent role in the energy storage world. And again, I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Yeah, well, that's, that's great to hear. California has these lofty goals. Again, that 2045 carbon neutrality goal is one that many of us are working with the state agencies and the governor to move that 2045 degree, uh, that 2045 carbon neutrality date forward. I've proposed a number of places that 2035, um, consistent with when President Biden wants the, 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 the national electricity sector 
to be carbon neutral would be a reasonable goal. Now, those are arguing for 2040, and we'll keep arguing. As we go forward, just to highlight this, um, we, we've already seen points where California has done pretty well. What this shows here is April 24th, 2021, when California hit 95% of all energy consumed from renewables. And this is in the spring. This is our best time. It's lowest demand, best wind, best solar, not late August, early September. And you can see renewables uh, spike up, natural gas use goes down, amount of hydropower goes to zero, and California became a net energy exporter during that moment. If we're update to last year, we don't have the, um, the April date numbers for 2020. But in, um, in 2022, we hit 104%, meaning not for more than um, a fraction of an hour. It was about a quarter hour. California met all of its electricity demand with renewables, something we've already seen in the UK, Costa Rica, Ireland. But as the world's fourth largest economy, um, I'm told recently California passed Germany. It may unpass. Um, but right now, we are the fourth largest. That is a significant number. And I would say, as we think about the storage uh, evolution, one critical feature here is that if in 2022, we can meet all our demand with renewables, the challenge is really on having storage catch up with that. And that's really where my lab takes place. I will not bore you because I'm, I'm going to assume that everyone has dissected and played with the so-called learning curve, um, just for those who haven't. Um, what we observe for technologies that can be mass produced, deployed, such as solar panels, that we see a learning curve like this. This is log log space. Time is a date stamp along the curve. It's neither the X or Y axis. Those are both log units of cost vertically and total cumulative production and installation. Um, then the so-called Moore's law or Swanson's law um, highlights here that we get about a 20% drop in price. That's the slope of this line for every time we double the amount of storage and that uh, <laughs> solar. And that's a remarkable curve, but it's not only true for solar. Here we have the exact same curve and dynamics for wind, solar and battery systems. And actually batteries have been improving each doubling of capacity slightly better than solar ever did um, at about 21 to 22%. And that's an aggregate number. That's looking at um, cost of storage deployed, looking at lithium ion, lithium plate, flow batteries, um, all integrated together. And of course, experts in different materials will dig in on their own favorite. But in terms of thinking about building out the energy the energy storage resource, it's a really interesting and critical story. And it's led to the statement, Bloomberg News published this in 2021, that essentially everywhere, it is now cheaper to build renewables than to operate existing fossil plants. The next version of this statement needs to be, it is now cheaper to build renewables with sufficient storage so they can be base load or 24 seven, whatever your favorite news bit is, than to operate existing fossil plants. We are not exactly there yet, but with these curves, we are getting close. So the analytics of learning curves are that we look at the cost at some future point C2 relative to the cost today. And the models that everyone uses is to look at the volume of technology, solar panels, big pens, calculators, um, storage units, um, the volume of sales relative to the volume at that base point to that negative exponent, the learning curve. Well, one of the projects that we did in our laboratory now um, some years ago, five years back, um, six years back uh, at this point, um, was to take this apart. And so a large project we did um, in conjunction with researchers at Imperial College was to reparametrize, to expand the data sets, to make them open access. Um, and what we found is that if you parametrize cost, not only as a function of the volume of sales, the so-called one parameter learning curve, a very dissatisfying feature if you're an academic, because you'd like to think that research matters or something. What we find is you get a far better fit, far better than just adding an extra variable. The whole collinearity issue is one we've dug into, and this is statistically significant, not just the fact that we're adding additional variables in the story. So what we find is that if you have a second term where you parameterize the investment in R&D, which is the hardest number to get, 
because even a grant or a company commitment to research in energy storage is often not a simple quantity to pull out. It's a bit tricky to identify exactly how much R&D money, unless you're really literally spending a storage energy research grant. Um, so we found is this is a far better fit. And actually our model, which has this R&D term in it, um, by both the California Energy Commission um, and a number of individual groups, Bloomberg New Energy is actually the best fit model. Here's the paper, came out in Nature Energy again back in 2017. And when we look at the learning curves for individual technologies, um, uh, what we're seeing here is in, in the blue triangles are lithium ion batteries. Um, we have flow batteries in here that are the circles. We have um, fuel cells on here. Pumped hydro doesn't show much learning because you don't get much better at doing something that simple. Lead acid batteries are here in the rust yellow color. And so you can see these learning curves are consistent, but the slopes are somewhat different. And our next paper that will, we hope, come out um, in May now includes also lithium uh, phosphate batteries, uh, which don't involve cobalt, one of the real bugaboos in terms of environmental justice. And it's that point that I want to turn to the source of these materials to really highlight how we have to think a little more broadly about the story. So this is a picture taken at COP26 in Glasgow. Um, this is the um, Power Africa, the, the uh, US Agency for International Development team, uh, Mark Corrado and myself, along with the Minister of Power um, in Nigeria, the Minister of Environment in Nigeria, and Damalola Ogunbi, who is the UN Special Representative for Energy Access. She is the Chair of Sustainable Energy for All. And one of the key issues is how can we not only deploy more and more storage, like through this innovation and policy landscape that I've described, but how can we also think very differently about energy services for the underserved in places that don't have um, big utility structures. And so again, I've mentioned in the beginning, I'm just back from Kenya and South Sudan. Um, and one of our projects there is a really a fascinating partnership. It's an effort where the German government, the UK government, the US government, um, as well as a new agency, an international group I'll mention in a second, are focused on energy access for low income communities, focused on electrifying health clinics. Across Africa, there is about 170,000 hospitals, regional health centers, and rural health clinics. Um, and here on the right-hand side, you can see a deployment of one particular technology. This is a US um, Italian mixed company called Off Grid Box. They make eight kilowatt and 15 kilowatt solar peak systems with four and eight kilowatt hour battery systems built in. They also do potable water. They provide Wi-Fi services and these are deployable containers. Um, and for larger facilities like you see in the center here, um, we need larger systems and we're working with many of the world's mini grid providers, all of which that have to grapple with not only providing storage, but also with providing storage that is reliable. And in my trip to South Sudan last week, we went to eight rural clinics in one day on the road between the, the national capital, Juba, on the Nile, and Bor, um, the second largest city, um, 180 kilometers north. Eight clinics, only two of them had working systems. In each case, the failure mode was the battery, and in one case, it was the inverter and the battery. So as we think through a mapping of all the health clinics, this partnership effort to build effort, both build data sets to analyze what are the failure modes of those clinics and what can we do to get there has resulted in a process where our partnership has identified these 100,000 clinics without power and has set up a roadmap to build and maintain health clinic electrification systems at 10,000 clinics by 2025, a goal that I think we'll actually reach early. We're already over halfway there. Um, but the monitoring, the maintenance, the training, um, being able to meet demands of new equipment, ultrasound machines, uh, freezers, not just refrigerators for vaccines and other features is part of the story. Um, my own lab is engaged in these build clinics to identify private sector partners that will be paid after the fact 
based on cold chains being maintained, radiological equipment being maintained, and energy being made available for sale for uh, local comp uh, for local businesses and homes that are clustered near many of the clinics. So that effort really highlights a, a, a huge um, continent-wide effort. Again, we're focused in my own lab in the Congo, in South Sudan, in Rwanda and Kenya. Um, and if you go to the link down below, you can get to the data, um, many of the papers around these efforts if you wanna see how we're working to deploy. And again, batteries have been the failure mode in almost all of the systems. The other side of the story, I wanna say just a few words before I close is to highlight um, places where we are looking aggressively at other forms of storage, in particular, some longer term, uh, longer term duration storage. And of course, give you, but there are some places that will have sets of battery, have lithium ion batteries um, that you just deploy temporarily in sequence. So maybe you go to six or eight hours by holding some of your batteries back, deploying later. That's a bit clunky. Um, we're looking at flow batteries. We just came back from an, a flow battery, a vanadium flow battery installation in French Polynesia. Um, but the other, of course, piece of the story that's got a lot of attention and a lot of very wildly differing views is on hydrogen. So Switch Japan is one of the models I mentioned. One of my uh, doctoral students, Kenji Shiriashi, and I recently completed this effort. And if you go online, you'll see there uh, we released a major report um, two weeks ago, highlighting uh, the ways for, Cal for Japan to get to a net zero uh, future, even if the nuclear um, restart that they've announced does not end up panning out. And I think the most interesting feature, if you graph here, see nuclear in this um, dark um, maroon color, um, hydrogen and light blue coming in, renewables, both wind and solar in the top colors, the green and yellow, is that there are scenarios that get Japan to um, uh, to zero carbon emissions. Um, and in almost all of these cases, hydrogen plays a major role, largely because Japan's best wind resource is offshore around Hokkaido in the north and in Okinawa, although Hokkaido is more likely to be a major national build out. And what we find is that 10% of all energy in Japan would pass through hydrogen um, as a transmission or storage medium in these scenarios. I'm gonna highlight this because that was certainly higher than I initially thought myself, but it highlights where we might be going on this. Jumping back to the, um, the energy access story, this is just the timeline I mentioned of going from where we are today, a few thousand electrified health clinics in some Saharan Africa. None of them would involve hydrogen. These would all likely be lithium batteries, although lithium phosphate is likely the new preferred one. There is discussion about rust batteries, and I think you've talked about Form Energy and some of the new rust companies, some of the companies, some, some of the flow battery companies, ESS and others coming up. And in this effort to ultimately build these sustainable clean energy nucleation sites at 100,000 health clinics across Africa. You can see the partners in this effort, Gavi is the International Vaccine Alliance, um, training and research efforts at the UN level, um, sustainable energy for all, my own laboratory rail at Berkeley. Um, and what's come of this effort is worth noting for those thinking about storage, not just for utility scale efforts. And that is with a billion dollars provided by the Bezos Earth Fund, and another billion by the Rockefeller Foundation, and almost half a billion from the IKEA Foundation. This effort, which has a name called GAP, the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, now doesn't have all the money it needs, but it has about $2.6 billion to launch this mini grid and healthcare deployment effort. And that really leads to my last minute or two of comments. And that is um, one of the features which Anyone who has seen international development projects and has any healthy degree of skepticism will know efforts that have throw numbers around like 10,000 clinics by 2025, 100,000 clinics eventually know that unless the technical story works and the financing story works, this is uh, another white elephant, elephant in the making. And batteries being the current weak link in that story is a reason why we have partnered with a Berkeley spin out company called Enline. Um, they make these small devices, you plug them in to the outlets, as you can see, you scan in the QR code, 
it uplinks and links the data from this particular device and it tracks outages and voltage and frequency. And so here's one that's just um, tracking um, the data flowing into this and the power flowing into this vaccine refrigerator here in the clinic in Goma in the, in, in the Congo. We typically install two or more devices in case one gets unplugged accidentally or on purpose. Um, at larger hospitals, we will maybe do four or five. Again, I just deployed 20 of these, 20 different clinics in South Sudan. Uh, there's programs to do several thousand of these in Eswatini, in Sierra Leone, and DRC, but it highlights the data tracking part of the story. For those clinics that are on grid or have text access, this will upload the data directly. But for those that are truly off grid, you need to either drive by the clinic and they'll upload it automatically to a receiver. Um, and in some cases, there's a few outlying ones where using Iridium and other satellite phones will upload the data there. But it highlights uh, being able to track in detail. And so we're looking at voltage, frequency um, variations, tracking. This is data from clinics, small clinics in Eastern Congo. And the last thing I will mention is really the integration question on the storage uh, and the vehicle side. And of course, everyone in California is familiar with this so-called duck curve. Um, and this highlights that as we deploy more and more renewables, we hollow out the net demand so that in California now with a great deal of solar, roughly 11 gigawatts of solar behind the meter around the state, um, we reduce net demand to a very low level, which of course um, works against deploying more renewable energy right when we want to deploy more, but then with evening peaks and high ramp rates, we really need to get power back in place. And so, of course, schematically, this so-called overabundance or problem in the, in the belly of the duck, if we can transfer this to the evening, we change the story entirely. And of course, that's precisely the story where we think storage, both stationary storage and storage in vehicles comes into play. So one kind of exciting version of this is that a few years ago, we did a simulation for New York City to look at what if every taxi in New York City was electric. Um, and so what you'll see here is a simulation run from midnight. Um, a, red a red dot is a taxi with a, with a rider, with a passenger. A blue is empty. I'll start running in from midnight. You can see they're moving around. It's now 1 a.m. Green is recharging in the middle of the night. And as we get to rush hour at about six, you'll notice a flood of red dots going into Manhattan. Here it comes. There they all flowed on in. First they were blue, then they were red. But now as rush hour passes, you're going to see green dots appearing down here in lower Manhattan as people want to recharge their vehicles without heading back to often where they charge where they live. So we did this simulation, worked through a plan to, to have New York City think about uh, converting its taxi fleet. They didn't do so, but China called and China said, um, we'd like to do this at scale. The city of Shenzhen said we would like to replace all 32,000 taxis in Shenzhen with EV taxis. For those of you with good eyes, you'll notice these, these are BYD, Build Your Dreams EV taxis. Um, BYD is based in Shenzhen, so the partnership is natural. And while Shenzhen may have a gender problem in its drivers of taxis, um, they were able to deploy, and my laboratory did the data science, um, because as soon as they deployed them, even though at that point, Shenzhen had the world's largest EV charging station with 600 EV bays, the problem they got was this. Here we have the taxis waiting to recharge. After a 12-hour shift, everyone was required to recharge to hand over the taxi fully charged. Um, so we did, of course, what anyone in Silicon Valley does, both at Stanford and Berkeley, is build an app. And here's our app that each driver gets that says how many bays are available. And you can schedule the time. And the more prompt you are at arrival when your time slot comes up, um, the more points you get. So you get priority seating, if you will. And you can see the picture of the driving bays here. And now Shenzhen is working to install inductive recharging of these batteries along the road here. I won't go into the details. I'm going to really end there because I've gone right to the end of my time. But I wanted to highlight that as we think about storage, there are these technological material science issues. Um, I highlighted some of that in the beginning with the learning, um, but also the role of hydrogen and something I'm not going to get into today, but we might discuss um, in, in the Q&A a little bit. And that is the exciting world of, of really ramping in not just marine energy um, in terms of all 
offshore wind, but offer uh, metal and wave energy. And there are companies now emerging that do things like this, that have wave buoys um, that are generating power, some for electricity directly, some to make hydrogen. And I think the last and most interesting feature, of course, is that the timing and periodicity of offshore energy is significantly different than onshore energy. And so thinking about storage, but also um, ways to think about um, convenient partnerships. And as, as Megan highlights the water role, I'm ending with a slide here that really just highlights the water opportunities as we think about what may be the biggest change in the world's energy sector the rest of this decade, and that is the rise of offshore energy. So thank you so much. I think I'm, a, I'm ending right about on time, and I appreciate and looking forward to our discussion at the end. Dan, thank you so much for that comprehensive overview. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, your highlight of the Africa energy storage solutions. So I thought we could start there and talk a little bit about trade-offs. So you highlighted many trade-offs for countries like US, Japan, China. How are these trade-offs different for Africa? Performance cost trade-offs, uh, manufacturability. Could you talk about the Africa-specific trade-offs? Absolutely. So let me, I, I'm going to take advantage of that to put a slide back up, I have to admit. Um, and that is, the, the trade-off in the Africa story is really simple on the technical side for these off-grid systems, on-grid big cities, places with well-functioning grids like Kenya, um, Senegal are exactly the same as we have as we have in our situation. And that is that we have many uh, groups that are keen to install renewable energy, um, California, Ireland, UK, et cetera, but not as keen to integrate in storage. Now that's an area where the UK and their national grid has taken a very aggressive role. The United Kingdom is converting its largest industrial center, Humber, to be a hydrogen powered hub so they are taking an aggressive role. I mentioned California with the storage mandate, but I think the real big story for this off-grid world is the other end of the life cycle value chain. And that is that much of our critical materials, I don't call them rare earths because they're not that rare. They are earth-based, but they're not rare um, in most cases, but the environmental and human rights abuses in and accessing many of these materials, in particular cobalt, is a critical part of the story. This is an open pit mine in the Congo. And as we think about the demand for energy storage, um, this clean energy transition that we must do is gonna be one where we transition from a hydrocarbon mentality to a metals and materials me mentality. Increase in demands between now and 2050 of up to a thousand percent are forecast. And again, lithium, which look massively scarce only 10 years ago. Calcium is not so scarce at all. We're finding it in the Salton Sea. We're finding in aquifers in Wyoming, in Madagascar, in, um, in a number of places in Australia. Um, and the demand for cobalt, which is again, the most human rights abusive of all critical materials today. If you go online, you'll see that cobalt demand has dropped dramatically in part because uh, people are moving away from their screens a little bit after COVID um, and the demand for electronics is down, but also in part because the shift from lithium ion to lithium phosphate batteries that do not require cobalt has really gone, I would say at this point, I don't wanna say swimmingly, but kind of wonderfully well, we've seen a real ramp up. So much so that Rwanda and Kenya and Senegal are all talking about in-country first assembly and then manufacturing of batteries using local materials. So I was just at a, um, at a mine in, um, in the Congo um, where they have facilities to, um, to smelt tin. They send their slag um, cedarite to Europe to be reprocessed to get out tantalum and neodymium and others. Um, but they are now looking at doing in country and they're appealing to the international community. Some of those billions I mentioned to really ramp that up. And I think the biggest part of the story will be if African governments are enabled, their private sectors are enabled to do local manufacturing, something that the West has been very, very poor at so far. That's really the story of how to make a sustainable 
um, storage industry in Africa and Southeast Asia. So thanks for letting me uh, go back to a slide and I will unshare. Dan, thank you. Thanks for highlighting the importance of local manufacturing as a way for economic development. So I, I guess what you're saying there is the technology choices might favor those that can be more easily manufactured locally. Uh, as Absolutely, to right. So materials that need to be sent off for secondary processing to get out the very low densities and often the toxic issues around cadmium, neodymium and others, that's an area where the international community needs to really listen when Again, the Kenyas, the Senegals, the Rwandas, countries that are proven they can manage these, um, uh, request that funding. That needs to happen. Otherwise, we essentially replace a, I would say, you know, in the crudest terms, a, a hydrocarbon colonialism with a material science colonialism. And that's not going to do any of us any good. Completely agree, Dan. Maybe let's take two more questions. Um, you showed um, this beautiful collection of cost learning curves. Let's talk about two aspects. One is intervention. How can policy and others' drivers be used to shift those learning curves? Especially- Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the beauty of these learning curves, um, and I'll just uh, jump way back to it. The beauty of them is that um, they have been so consistent for so long. When you look at these curves, first the one for solar that everyone's familiar with, going back to the 70s, um, and then the one that we kind of focused on today on energy storage. Um, what it really highlights here is that if we take seriously what we find analytically to be true, yes, you could parameterize in a one parameter world, just more sales, but really R&D plays a critical role. And again, we find that the fit is massively better. It's about 60% better if you include in an in R&D terms. What this says is that policies that forward price they give benefits for storage, such as right now in California. Well, we're not, we have not taken on the so-called NEM 2.0 or NEM 3, this net energy meeting story, particularly smartly. We are shifting California's sub. You can no longer get a subsidy just for installing solar. But if you install solar in storage, as we have in my garage, not my car, but I have a stationary storage bank in the, in, in, in the garage, you can get a subsidy still. So that says volume pricing is one thing. So if we forward price, give a benefit to install at companies and businesses, that will push the price down. But it also says that we need to maintain and to track and to quantify the R&D dollars. And while we're having this meeting, the ARPA-E summit is taking place. Um, that's a place where R&D money for storage is going in. But increasingly, tracking dollars that go to R&D or RMB or euros, that go to storage is one thing, but storage only is only useful as part of an integrated package with clean energy generation. And so really we're gonna to have to get even more sophisticated adding other terms here and deconvolving. What about an investment in flow battery plus micro hydro or green hydrogen plus wind generation? Those are gonna to need to be the frontier for bright young students who want to kind of take this sort of work and evolve further. It's that deconvolution where energy science and data science are going to have to become a real partner to highlight exactly what you're talking about here. What do we get by investing in different packages as we need to accelerate this transition? Thank you, Dan. We have time for just one final question. So again, on the learning curves, there are there are there is a little bit of spread between the different energy technology in terms of the learning curve exponent. Do you expect going forward there to be a diversity in the learning rates? And if so, you know how do we um, incentivize the system to pick the max learning rates? Yeah, so this is an area where um, I think your perspective is going to vary. So I'm a physicist, and one of the things that physicists learn and try to tell other people um, is that you should not get too excited about the fine structure in vague variables. So this is a log log plot. And so if we look back here, for example, um, at the famous solar learning curve, there are people who went to town trying to understand this little dip here. Why did the prices drop here? Why did they go back up? This is um, chasing data that is probably illusory because we, what we know now is that this bump and dip actually happened when two big German uh, PV manufacturing facilities came online, the capacity went way up, prices dipped down. 
But overall, over decades, that has been a pretty straight line. So I would caution people to read too much into the fine structure. But the broad structure is really interesting. And that is that we consistently see you centralize manufacturing, so-called Japanese or just-in-time um, source materials, find ways to get leaner and meaner, both on the amount of materials, reducing the amount of actual atoms and molecules, and more efficient saws for solar cells, better thin film deposits, better use of reagents, all of that, it really makes a difference. And so I would say the lesson here is very broadly the case that if you ma mass produce it and you deploy it, learning curves are gonna be your friend. But picking out the details on those bumps has historically proven to be an effort where it's garbage in, garbage out. You find and get what you want to find, not what's necessarily there. Thank you, Dan, for the great discussion. All right, and that's now, uh, thank Dan, and we will have our second speaker and then we'll return to have a, a short discussion with everyone at the end of the seminar. Good morning, Megan's greatest Good morning. Speaker. How are you? Great to see you. I'm doing well, thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to have my colleague Megan Motter speak um, today. And um, Megan is working in the area of sustainable water supply. And um, in the past couple of years, she has been extending this to the intersection of the water and energy system, and specifically looking at the role of water for energy storage. Uh, so this is a, a new topic for us at StorageX, but one that is very exciting. Uh, let me also just say a few words about Megan's broader contributions. Uh, she's working uh, uh, in the area of water treatment, water management, water policy, and she also is the research director for the National Alliance for Water Innovation. That's a, a hub funded by the Department of Energy. So Megan, we're really excited to hear from you today on how water energy storage can be connected and new ways of thinking about it. Thank you, right. Megan. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Will. And uh, I think Dan set me up really nicely just talking about uh, you know, the host of um, real opportunities that exist across the energy storage space. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about energy flexibility innovations in the water sector and really the ways in which uh, we can think about to the water and wastewater sectors as um, sort of industrial energy loads um, that have flexibility and can help support a really stable um, and reliable grid. So I think we're all here because we understand that solving the gigaton carbon problem is really going to require what I call a 6D revolution. Um, we need to diversify our sources, we need to decentralize um, a lot of our generation, um, we need to decarbonize uh, that generation, um, we need to decouple energy storage capacity um, and, and supply uh, by decoupling supply and demand. Uh, we need to continue to drive down the energy intensity of our uh, unit operations, and we're going to digitize all of this because um, the future is not uh, people turning on and off uh, their switches manually. Um, and I'll just say, you know, I, I recognize I'm speaking to an energy storage audience here. Um, the, the way in which I think we've increasingly started to think about uh, realizing a stable electricity grid um, is certainly through storage um, as well as through industrial energy flexibility. And so really having um, control over the timing of loads is, is absolutely imperative. Um, when you have a large taxi fleet, that's, that's certainly one way to do it. Uh, but there's still going to be a lot of base load demand uh, throughout your system uh, that hasn't historically had the, that same degree of flexibility. Um, and so a, a big challenge is trying to realize um, energy flexibility uh, in some of the more energy intensive industrial sectors. Um, at the same time, my own research uh, realizes that you know a, a lot of the effects of climate change are actually going to be felt through the water cycle. And so, as well mentioned, I a scholar that works primarily in the water cycle um, on water systems, both thinking about how uh, we need to adapt our water systems um, to accommodate major changes in where precipitation falls, when precipitation falls, um, as well as how water ends up being used um, in those places. And then uh, in parallel with that, thinking about how we mitigate um, the effects of tapping non-traditional water sources, um, particularly reducing the carbon intensity of water treatment. 
And so when I am thinking through the, the process of developing new infrastructure um, for the water sector, um, I think I'm, I am trying to keep kind of at, at the front of uh, mind the, the real importance of um, how we are ultimately going to integrate that water sector um, with the electricity sector. And so um, one of the ways I think we can potentially do that uh, is to follow a similar pathway to the pathway that the electricity sector uh, is headed down. I like to say that the water sector is 30 years behind the electricity sector, but we're all headed in the same direction. Um, we are going to really require a similar set of up 60 transitions. So we're diversifying away from conventional freshwater sources to a whole host of non-traditional water sources, would be that seawater, um, wastewater reuse, um, industrial water reuse, brackish groundwater, um, et cetera. We're also really starting to think through a, a comparable transition um, to the transition of you know, large centralized coal fire generation to uh, solar cells where it's on everybody's roof. Um, to a, a similar decentralization of the water sector, thinking about on-site reuse of water, even in one's home. Um, again, we need to decarbonize these processes, and, and that's easier um, in some uh, water treatment uh, installations than others. Uh, there's opportunities to uh, use what I think are um, a tremendous amount of storage infrastructure that is currently underutilized um, to help uh, transition this water system to a, a future decentralized system, but also um, potentially to really think about integration um, with the electricity grid. We still need to focus relentlessly on it and uh, water efficiency. Um, and just as you're not going to you know, be turning on and off uh, switches manually all over the place, um, you're not going to run a complex water network um, using uh, people and heuristics. Um, you're going to do it certainly with uh, the people present, um, but with the assistance of uh, a, a future digitized uh, water grid. And so, uh, you know, as this water sector transition um, unfolds, I think that it, it's, um, it's really exciting, but it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I think uh, that a lot of my work is focused on um, really enabling these to 60 transitions in the energy and water sector um, to happen um, in, in an integrated uh, and synergistic way. And so uh, my work uh, largely focuses on how do you coordinate um, these future systems, um, particularly when they are more fully uh, 60 and to really support affordability uh, of the energy and water sector as well as resiliency of the energy and water sector. And so I like to think about uh, how to maximize energy flexibility uh, opportunities across the water supply chain. Um, our group has done a lot of work on the transmission side, thinking about source switching and pumping cessation uh, in large scale water distribution, what I should say water transmission systems. Um, you know, the, the state water project in California remains a tremendously large um, demand response provider and, and really helps us to stabilize our grid here. Uh, but there are uh, many other uh, places around the world uh, where this is also going to be pretty important. Um, we have thought a lot about storage and how you use water storage. There's a lot of excess water storage capacity in our system, uh, particularly, it might not be excess all the time, um, but it's definitely excess in some periods of the year. Uh, and so how do you use that more effectively? Um, how do you start to run your treatment systems um, in new ways, uh, intermittently, um, you know, turning on and off really energy intensive processes? Um, how do you use the distribution system where there's even more storage uh, and uh, particularly storage uh, in you know, those very visible water tanks, uh, but ways to not only um, store water uh, in publicly owned water tanks, but also thinking about how you flex consumer demand uh, and uh, use that to uh, also provide uh, some load shifting capability. Uh, and then we do a lot of work in water reuse. So again, um, how do you tie in the um, wastewater sector uh, into this equation, uh, particularly uh, on, on that front, 
Um, there's a lot of effort in on-site electricity generation at wastewater facilities um, and on-site electricity storage even. Um, so our, our lab broadly develops tools to do energy planning and investment de-risking in the water sector to help uh, utilities quantify bill savings and carbon reductions from implementing uh, some of these approaches and then ultimately to develop um, control platforms that help uh, those operators uh, manage their energy in real time um, while not sort of seriously inflating their, their risk profile. So I wanna go into um, several different studies that we've done uh, along this overview figure and um, give you a little bit more color uh, behind each of those uh, potential storage mechanisms. So I'm going to start out with uh, a study that we've done at uh, wastewater treatment plants, um, really looking at how on-site electricity generation, uh, electricity storage, um, water storage, and intermittent operation um, can be used together uh, to help shift load uh, and save bills uh, at these wastewater treatment plants. So why uh, why the uh, wastewater treatment sector? Well. Um, Wastewater is actually really energy intensive. Uh, at the moment, it consumes somewhere between one and 2% of US electricity, uh, but that is rapidly growing as uh, new water quality um, regulations come into effect and especially nutrient recovery um, becomes required. Uh, so we're, we're seeing a, a major expansion in energy intensity uh, of the sector. Uh, another really particularly problematic issue is that um, you know, even at facilities, uh, especially those in, here in the Bay Area, like East Bay Mud uh, and Silicon Valley Clean Water, which is the uh, site that I'm going to cover today, uh, that actually capture their biosolids, digest that on site. You may see those big uh, you know, digesters, sludge digesters um, that generate biogas. Um, that biogas generation is both incredibly unreliable. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's kind of standard combustion uh, turbines that are being used, and and they are, do not always perform very reliably with um, what is you know middling quality biogas. Um, and even more importantly, that that generation tends to be pretty poorly timed with demand. So we end up flaring a very large quantity of the biogas that we end up producing. Um, these facilities are also facing um, some stress in that. Uh, you know, electricity is 25 to 40% of their operational costs. Um, that is a lot uh, for a water facility. And we've seen pretty rapidly increasing electricity costs over the past couple of years. And so this is, is starting to pinch uh, these wastewater uh, facilities and, and they're, they're trying to figure out how to respond to that. Uh, in particular here in California uh, and parts of New York, those demand charges end up being a pretty large fraction of the electricity bills. Uh, and the projection is that you know, given um, increasing uh, adoption of renewable energies and, and uh, that debt curve that Dan talked about, uh, people expect the electricity bills at these facilities to grow pretty substantially. Um, so I think that over uh, the, you know, over the next, uh, 10 to 20 years, there's going to be a real demand for understanding how to uh, transition these uh, wastewater treatment facilities um, into more flexibly operated uh, facilities. And uh, I sort of scroll through um, some of the uh, low profiles in this bottom figure as I uh, was talking, but uh, you can see this again is for Silicon Valley Clean Water, where we have uh, this baseload demand is in uh, the, the light gray in the back uh, and the, the generation uh, from these uh, uh, sludge digesters uh, producing biogas and then being combusted on site um, in the pink. Uh, you can see it doesn't, it doesn't fully match uh, those needs, but sort of critically, you, you commonly have these big outages. Uh, so we're interested in then simulating how load shift um, could help to uh, reduce the energy bills of these plants and um, at the same time, uh, end up helping to stabilize the grid. So what are the energy flexibility resources um, that we might deploy to do that? Um, well, the first is uh, to intelligent, more intelligently deploy the batteries um, that have often been purchased uh, to enhance plant reliability. Uh, I want to remind you uh, that 
wastewater treatment plants require a lot of electricity, if there are power outages, um, that is very problematic. And so um, it's quite common for uh, wastewater facilities to have some sort of either energy storage or backup generator um, present on site so that they can um, you know, do their job when uh, the, the power grid uh, fails. And so we're, we've done a lot of work to think about how to more intelligently deploy those batteries um, and, and help use them, not just for resiliency applications, but also um, to help shift load uh, at these facilities. Um, alternatively, we can really dig into the, the nuts and bolts of how treatment plants work uh, and uncover a lot of uh, pretty diverse um, alternative storage options. So uh, you may not know, but wastewater treatment facilities actually have a tremendous amount of wastewater storage, um, both upstream of the plant, uh, Silicon Valley Clean Water, again, here uh, in Redwood City, uh, is in the process of building an enormous uh, tunnel uh, to store wastewater. And, and that's important because when you get big atmospheric river events um, or general storm events, uh, you need a place to um, store water and help equalize load through your wastewater treatment facility. Uh, this is also really common uh, on the East Coast. Uh, I should say it's increasingly common on the East Coast uh, because of combined sewer overflow regulations uh, forcing a sort of large interceptor design. So there's this amazing amount of uh, water storage uh, that is in the process of being built and commissioned. Um, there's also uh, primary effluent storage within the plant that's not visualized here. Um, there's the ability to store biosolids, uh, and then there's actually the ability to store gas. A lot of sites do biogas storage to uh, reduce flaring um, and, and effectively also reduce their local emissions. Um, but facilities, even though they have all these things, they, they really struggle with planning and coordinating these energy flexibility resources because A, there's a bunch of different options. Um, B, the storage types are really inter interdependent. If you store wastewater, uh, your biogas production is going to be changed and uh, it's hard to anticipate um, some of those interdependencies. The optimal configuration for how to do this is really site specific. Uh, and there's also um, some sort of uh, major issues with thinking about deploying infrastructure for for multiple purposes, right? So we all love the idea of multifunctional infrastructure because um, you know you you get way more bang for your buck, and at the same time uh, you expose yourself to slightly uh, larger quantities of risk, um, and that risk might be very marginal and, and totally worth accepting. But um, I think it's really important when talking to operators and, and understanding um, what is going to um, enhance adoption. Uh, to provide them with risk-aware insight um, into their operation of multifunctional uh, infrastructure assets. Uh, so a lot of what uh, we have been working on, uh, this is a project that was funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, EERES, uh, Wastewater uh, Resource Recovery Program, um, but we've been working uh, on this program and designing a design tool, building a design tool uh, to help identify cost optimal uh, storage upgrades to these wastewater treatment plants. Um, and what this project does is build digital twins of those wastewater treatment facilities that combine uh, both statistical learning and process-based um, modeling to really um, capture uh, and evaluate the effects of water storage, gas storage, and electricity storage upgrades um, and relate those to uh, ROI numbers, return on investment numbers, um, and the effects uh, for these wastewater facilities on their bill savings. Um, so I, I'm gonna go sort of briefly um, over some of uh, the results from this paper. Uh, this is currently uh, under review and uh, should be out soon. Uh, we've done a lot of work thinking about just generally, what are the, the different advantages and disadvantages of, of these different storage types? So we've got battery storage, gas storage, raw water storage, and primary effluent storage. Um, and, you know, they certainly all have very different characteristics in terms of um, the way that we would typically think about uh, sort of a virtual battery. Um, and it, I would say most <laughs> distinctively is uh, this kind of capital cost range. Um, so this assumes uh, new builds for all of those um, not using existing facilities, but we wanted to get a sense of um, if you were just to uh, deploy these uh, resources kind of from scratch, um, what would their uh, respective costs be and, and what would the expected bill savings be? Um, and I should say this is all for one hour 
uh, or one load hour equivalent at the plant. So um, you know, one, one hour of, of standard plant uh, electricity load. Uh, and, and what you can see is that here, um, you know, there's there's value in uh, battery that, that far exceeds um, the the battery or should say the storage value uh, of some of these other assets. Um, and it, yet there's a lot of diminishing returns on um, the size of that battery uh, over time. So as you get larger and larger batteries, of course, um, you you can flex into uh, larger um uh, biogas generator outages, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know your your effective uh, cost of that battery size goes up, and so um, you're really trying to understand how much storage uh, you want to deploy at these plants. Um, we've also looked at the synergies between uh, these different storage types. Uh, but one of the interesting things, this is kind of a, a modified uh, Shapley analysis, is that. Uh, it, there's actually not a lot of synergies um, between uh, batteries uh, and some of the other uh, some of the other storage techniques. We expected to see much greater synergies uh, than than we did, uh, and that was a, a surprise to us. But it also challenges us um, to differentiate between uh, retrofits at plants and uh, green builds. And I think a green build uh, might help us tap uh, synergies in ways that uh, we were not able to at this particular plant. Um, the, the next analysis we did was really looking at, okay, given Silicon Valley clean water, um, instead of looking at one load hour equivalent deployment, um, what is the optimal deployment of these um, energy flexibility assets, uh, both in an instance in which uh, a plant had a co-generator facility um, and one in which they did not have a co-generator facility. Um, and the first takeaway is that when you have co-gen, there's much greater value in storage. So there's a real positive synergy um, between those two uh, technologies at these plants. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, you know, the battery continues to be a, a really valuable so the, the preferential mode of storage, um, but there's actually also pretty, uh, if, if you already had uh, storage on site um, at a facility, but you didn't have a battery, um, there, there are still um, some pretty positive return on investments um, and, and overall uh, bill savings opportunities uh, for, these, for these plants. Um, we've gone ahead and done this, as I mentioned, at Silicon Valley Clean Water. Uh, but we've also explored deployment at Watsonville and Santa Barbara. Um, and I'll just say that at, at Silicon Valley Clean Water, um, especially, it was really interesting to look at um, how the existing battery uh, differed from what would have been the, the optimal battery deployment. Um, so both in terms of battery power and battery capacity, uh, that existing battery uh, is uh, both a, a little bit uh, it, it, it's a little bit missized um, for that plant. And so uh, there was kind of some effective loss in, in net present value um, because of suboptimal battery design. So it's really important to think about um, pretty site specific design factors uh, when going into, um, going into a plant and, and thinking about helping them um, do energy flexibility uh, retrofits and upgrades. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead there and just say that, uh, you know, on the whole, this project has been really um, interesting in, in helping us to look at how wastewater facilities could couple on-site biogas generators and batteries um, to help provide uh, some of that bi-directional energy storage. Uh, there's also these opportunities in biogas storage um, that, that effectively are providing uh, chemical and fuel storage. Um, and then we also have uh, controllable loads by storing water, modifying uh, or modulating aeration, uh, et cetera. And so I think that really speaks to some of this flexible generation and controllable load question. Um, you know, I, I realize I'm speaking to a storage audience, not a wastewater audience. So I, I wanted to relate that back um, to the, the areas of uh, storage that, that DOE um, highlights. Okay, I'm going to move on and, and just go much more quickly through some of these other studies that we've um, undertaken. Uh, one is uh, particularly looking at water storage systems. Um, and actually, I should point out that this is um, water storage in the distribution system. So I'm sorry that the uh, arrow should go over here. But um, you know, a, a big piece of um, deploying storage, as I mentioned, is, is in risk-aware um, dispatchability of these storage resources um, or virtual batteries, and um, that's particularly important for the water sector. You know, the, the water sector 
has a really clear mission of providing clean uh, water in a reliable manner, uh, not just for drinking water applications, but for fire. Uh, we, you know, fire control uh, is really what dictates an awful lot of our um, water distribution system design. And uh, you, you must plan for um, unexpected events um, in that distribution system design. And so what we wanted to do is develop a, um, you know, a, a tool that would help distribution system operators and utilities uh, to really understand how much additional um, risk they were taking on and, and also what was the additional value add um, to the utility from a revenue perspective um, in terms of uh, accepting that risk. So uh, many people have built water distribution system optimization models that minimize the, the electricity costs of pumping water from the treatment plant um, to consumers. And this, uh, in this study, we, we recreated one of those and, and basically um, looked at an optimized pumping schedule for a city of about 20,000 people. Um, you can see that you minimize your pumping load uh, when you have high electricity prices uh, and vice versa, okay? Um, the, the next thing we did um, is asked, you know, what is the um, additional load shifting capacity uh, that uh, pump scheduling and water tank drawdown might provide if an emergency DR call was issued? Um, and, you know, I would say that the, uh, we looked at a couple of different demand response uh, timeframes. Um, we, we looked at uh, different notification windows, um, different shed windows, uh, and then different recovery windows um, in the system. And uh, in doing so, we acknowledged that the you know, utility might not want to fully draw down their water tank reserves because they'd want to make sure that they had sufficient water supplies to meet you know, demand and pressure throughout the system um, if there was an unexpected event. Um, and so the, the risk tolerance of the utility um, would probably depend on, on what level of compensation um, they would get for different notification load shed and recovery period durations. Um, so the, the upper plot uh, characterizes a, a range of timeframes we, we looked at for each of those periods. Um, and then this lower graph here um, just does this for a recovery period of eight hours, um, which is a, a pretty long recovery period that would represent pretty um, serious drawdown at your tanks. Uh, and uh, we look at you know, what is the, um, you know, the, the optimal load curtailment or shed fraction under different compensation prices. Uh, so the, the takeaway from the study is really that, um, you know, we, you need to uh, allow utilities to make choices and informed choices uh, based on their own knowledge of the system uh, and their own understanding of how long it's going to take uh, to recover. And that's going to end up informing um, what price they're willing to bid uh, in, in these uh, markets. Um, the sort of next study I want to kind of quickly go through um, is one of intermittent process control. So, uh, you know, we've done a lot of thinking about uh, how you would um, turn on and off treatment plants um, to modulate the, the duration um, and, and timing of uh, particularly energy intensive processes. Uh, and at the same time, um, you know, I think there's a, a fun story to tell about how uh, intermittency in, in treatment plant operation is not actually all that uncommon. Um, maybe not on those short time scales, but certainly on long time scales. So I want to open with a positive story here. Um, that is uh, one, uh, this is a picture of um, Santa Barbara's Charles E. Meyer desalination facility uh, in Santa Barbara. Um, the, this facility uh, is you know, pretty energy intensive. Um, they consume about four megawatts on an ongoing basis. Uh, and the um, plant operators are also very, very interested in uh, trying to help support uh, a, a fully decarbonized water system. And so have been pretty progressive in thinking about how um, they might actually you know, participate in energy flexibility um, and uh, activities and, and DR calls. And so on um, September 5th, uh, this past September, uh, right over Labor Day weekend, there was a huge heat wave. It was kind of an emergency situation, and all of the uh, utilities started getting calls. You know, can you uh, can you shut down some part of your your operation? And so Santa Barbara said sure, um, and they ended up uh, shedding load from five to nine p.m. 
Um, and they actually got paid a pretty decent amount of money for that. Um, that this represents a, a healthy fraction of their monthly bills. Uh, and so they came to me and said, well, you know, can how 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 possible would it be to do this on a much more regular basis? And what would the value be? Uh, so we're actually just getting that project uh, up and running. I'm trying to understand uh, not just how they could flex operate their existing plant, but they're also considering a desal expansion. Um, so they are, are thinking about uh, nearly doubling the size of their desalination plant to accommodate drought. Um, and they're wondering whether they can, um, in building out that desalination plant capacity, um, also build in greater energy flexibility. Um, and which brings me to this other interesting case in Santa Barbara, uh, which uh, this is the same facility, um, which is that it was initially built uh, in 1992 uh, because there had been a big drought. And then in uh, 92, it, it ran for three months um, and uh, then it started raining and raining and raining and raining and all the reservoirs were full and they shut down the plant after only three months of operation. Um, and the, the big challenge was, okay, what do we do with this huge piece of infrastructure that um, we are no longer using? Uh, and they ended up basically selling it for parts um, and totally deconstructed it. And then uh, 30 years later, recommissioned it and uh, got it going again after another large draft. Um, but the reality is that they spent a lot of money. Uh, I think it was 70, something like $72 million to build a facility. Uh, and if you just average that over the three months of water production, uh, it comes out to something like $104 a gallon. So a lot of money. Um, and I think that this speaks to the fact that like we are going to experience um, sort of futures in which uh, we're going to see droughts, we're going to see uh, we're going to see you know, large precipitation events, um, and our infrastructure in the water space is going to have to become much more adaptable um, over a whole host of different um, time domains. So uh, we can think about uh, all of the different. Uh, time domains over which these desalination plants um, need to be flexibly operated uh, and the, the potential synergies uh, in that flexible operation. Um, so everything from the decadal scale of like, do you, should you expand that uh, Santa Barbara plant, uh, especially given that we've had an incredibly wet winter uh, and all of Santa Barbara's uh, reservoirs are now full. Um, there's also uh, questions of, you know, how do you operate much more on an hourly or daily um, scale where maybe you can modulate uh, your, oops, I'm sorry, uh, maybe you can modulate your water recovery uh, to you know, not consume so much energy um, during that four to nine uh, window or five to nine window uh, and uh, help uh, shed some of the load that would typically um, be consumed by the plant. So we're trying to think about um, lots of different time domains um, in these facilities. And I, I'm going to kind of go pretty quickly through this, but um, in doing so, we're, we're integrating um, short-term flexibility um, sort of with long-term flexibility and in terms of drought intensity. Um, and we've done some really nice work uh, with my colleagues, uh, Sarah Fletcher here in the CEE department um, and a, a co-advised postdoc, Marta Zaniolo, uh, really simulating what future drought scenarios might look like um, and how uh, our different types of um, water treatment capacity, uh, this red is base load uh, desal capacity, uh, might uh, actually end up being deployed over those long periods. And I think the, the question is uh, within this, uh, maybe it makes more sense to develop facilities that don't have base load capacity in the way that we historically think of it, um, but they themselves end up being very flexible. So it's not just an on off, but um, you know, you're know you really thinking about on off during different periods of the day um, so that you're actually reducing overall water production capacity um, and uh, really reducing the, the carbon intensity um, and, and electricity bills of operating those systems. Um, right now, uh, we're depending on a lot of this kind of peaking capacity from uh, smaller plants, and we're using desal plants as a base load. Okay, the final um, piece I want to cover is uh, just thinking about demand curtailment. So uh, the electricity uh, sector has done a lot of work on how do you shed load at the consumer scale, 
Uh, I think there are similar opportunities in the water space, um, particularly focused on um, the timing of, of irrigation um, for our lawns. And uh, to support some of that, uh, we've built a uh, what we call a flow backtracking model um, that helps us determine what is the marginal energy intensity, the marginal cost, and the marginal carbon intensity of delivering a unit of water to a specific person, uh, or I should say a specific node in the water distribution system, um, as a function of time of day. And this, uh, again, is a picture of Santa Barbara. Uh, you can see that um, the marginal energy intensity, uh, so this is kilowatt hours per cubic meter of water delivered, um, is very high in the low flat areas, and that's because they're receiving water um, from the water desalination plant. Um, it is also um, high up on the hills, uh, and so, uh, you know, this is obviously very unique to Santa Barbara. Um, the inverse, well, I shouldn't say the inverse, but um, sort of the inverse is true in Berkeley, where the Berkeley Hills, you know, the, the energy intensity of pumping it up to the top of the Berkeley Hills is incredibly high, uh, and the energy intensity is much lower uh, in the flats. Um, so we've used these uh, marginal energy intensity uh, models to help uh, develop a couple of tools. One is uh, a tool for helping to price water at different locations and times of day to incentivize irrigation, water demand, site management. Uh, this is not adopted anywhere, uh, but we think it will be. Uh, Sydney Water especially is interested in, in actually having um, pretty dramatic time of use pricing um, in their water supply. Um, we've also uh, developed tools to help utilities uh, realize carbon reduction goals without costly infrastructure upgrades. Um, and then we've thought about where to deploy um, on-site water recycling units uh, to help support um, energy efficient, uh, uh, I should say an energy efficient water system. So I just want to wrap up by saying again that uh, 60 transitions don't happen in silos. Uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for the water sector and the energy sector to co-develop, um, particularly the water sector to co-develop alongside a changing electricity sector uh, and really play a, a powerful role in um, flexible load operation um, to stabilize the electricity grid. I'm going to wrap up by uh, thanking uh, all of my wonderful uh, postdocs uh, and PhD students, uh, as well as the collaborators on some of the projects from Raja Kabal here at Stanford, Sarah Fletcher, uh, also in the department in Silicon Valley Clean Water. And with that, I will end. Megan, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great overview of the water energy system. So we have time for maybe one or two questions, and then we can come um, to a panel discussion with Dan. So Megan, in your talk, you highlighted both how batteries could be deployed um, to make the water system more efficient, but also how the uh, water treatment system can be used to decrease the need for batteries. Yeah. I was curious if you can comment for the latter, how big a, an impact would it have, sort of how much batteries would it replace if we properly utilize, say, water treatment, biogas generation, and how much battery would that replace? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and it is incredibly um, site specific, right? It's hard to say that in, in a really general way because both of the local characteristics of your energy sector, but also the very, very um, site specific dependencies of your water sector. Um, you know, I think the easiest way to think about this is how much energy is consumed by the water sector. Again, that is very site specific. In California, it's incredibly energy intensive. Um, you know, somewhere around five percent of uh, California uh, electricity is consumed both in pumping and treating water. Um, in other places, it's incredibly low. I mean, you know, you've got gravity-fed systems that um, are really have minimal treatment, uh, and so yeah, there there isn't a whole lot of um, energy flexibility sitting there on the table. Uh, so I would say. You, know, you really need to do site-specific analysis to answer that question. But you know, we we do we're looking you know in a desal facility at megawatt uh, levels of uh, flexibility delivered to the grid. Um, if you know Santa Barbara's usual base load capacity uh, or say base load um, energy consumption is about four megawatts. So um, you know you think about okay could I fully shut that down? 
Um, could I fully shut that down for four hours? Could I surely fully shut that down? You know, you, you have a lot of flexibility in the duration um, as long as you don't have a lot of constraints on your water production. And so, you know, again, I think it's it's how do you manage these coupled systems that becomes the, the real question. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to understand the order of magnitude of yeah. how big the impact it would have. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, duration, right? There's a lot of um, complex coupling um, on the duration, like you said, the water treatment needs to happen at some very specific intervals. Yeah. So what are the range of durations that you think could be viable? I think you mentioned one hour okay. in talk. Is that sort of the ballpark we should be thinking about? No. So so I, I'm sorry I didn't make that more clear. We, we did analysis for like one hour battery storage, especially. Um, it is uh, and, and there's diminishing, you know, there's diminishing returns from the bill savings perspective at these utilities. But if you re-optimize this for carbon, it gives you a very, very different, um, you know, if you're optimizing this for the grid, instead of optimizing this for the, the plant, you get a very different opt, uh, optimum outcome. And that was actually a, a really important insight that we had, um, which is that this is actually very, very low cost uh, carbon reduction. Um, because you can do very long duration storage. So those wastewater interceptors, um, you know, when it's not raining uh, here in California, which is mo like, I won't say all the time, but you know, a, a healthy fraction of the year, it's not raining, right? Um, and so doing storage, um, th those can store massive amounts of flow um, for long, long periods. We capped it in our analysis at 24 hours because of some of the, um, risk of going anaerobic um, in those systems and the, the risk of downstream water quality impacts. You don't want them to be smelly either, honestly. That's a big problem. You start to generate methane and hydrogen sulfide. Um, but <laughs> that aside, sorry, um, it, we're looking at much longer duration of storage. So 24 hours, six hours um, at, at very, very low cost. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Megan. I think that gives us a sense. So, yeah. so on the cost aspect, I think what's really exciting here is, as you mentioned, much of the capital is already deployed and the, the, the equipment is on the ground already. Um, what, is, what are the barriers now to implementing? Um, because most of, the, most of the fiscal stuff is already there. Yeah, so um, the barriers are, uh, I think, twofold. Um, the first is that we do need to deploy this. I mean, I think at, at um, when you do anything at scale, uh, it, you run into challenges that you didn't, don't anticipate. I think especially understanding um, whether a treatment plant would need to adapt any of their water treatment, downstream water treatment unit operations is important. Um, you know, we already do a lot of water storage and so uh, to equalize load. And so I, I, I really don't think that that's a huge risk. Um, but we need to see it. Um, and I think water treatment plant operators especially need to see that because there's an inherent um, risk uh, avoidance uh, within those operators to toward new change to their, their plants. Um, so the people side is a big one. Um, the other big, big issue is just like, how many operators do you have and how are they going to think about controlling this alongside all the other things that they're trying to do? And the, the human, I mean, again, this is a human piece, but the human element cannot be understated. Um, the wastewater treatment plant today, um, and it was staffed by uh, a person of an average age of 54. Um, the, there's not a tremendous amount of digital fluency. There's a lot of clipboards and paper. Uh, and so getting uh, digital systems deployed where, you know, again, the future is not people running around throwing switches, the future or turning on and off pumps. Um, the future is to really have this um, be integrated and certainly overseen by people and people are part of uh, making decisions on, on whether or not uh, to participate, but um, you know, I think the actual operation of the system needs to be uh, digitized. And and for the wastewater sector, there is a big uh, that that represents a big shift. Um, so again, we're thirty years behind uh, the electricity sector, but we will get there. Great, Megan. Thank you so much. Um, let me invite Dan to to come back to the stage as well. <laughs> We have about uh, 20 or so minutes in which we can have, and hopefully a spirited discussion on energy storage. Um, 
Dan, maybe I can ask you to start. Um, I, I realized that um, we didn't really comment on the scale of energy storage that is required for the grid. So, so Dan, can you comment a little bit on um, approximately the terawatt hour that is needed um, to start to make a difference um, at the grid level? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is kind of a big picture modeling question, right? Because if, for example, you have more reliable hydro, which we don't have in California anymore, um, we're talking about the biggest dam in the US, the Grand Coulee Dam, for example, being shifted from a primary generator to a battery to only being used for load following. Big swings in thinking about big hydro facilities. The governor, for example, asked me in the switch model to zero out hydro entirely from California's mix so we can save water for agriculture. And ideally, my pushback is, but let's save water for nature and communities, not just agriculture since agriculture consumes 70%. So that's Megan's territory, but that was my little rant on it. So if you think about a kind of a digitally super interconnected area, Northern California, the UK, where you're actually planning to have a more diverse set of renewables, the numbers I showed you in that, in, in that study we did for National Grid, where they found, with, using their constraints, we found that you need between 60 and like 110% of generation capacity available in storage. And of course, as Megan and I both highlighted, we had these outage events, near outage events in September, where we were teetering on it in California. We made it largely because there was so much behind the meter solar and because people conserved a bit. So it really depends on where you are. There's no single answer, but I think that's this is a place where modelers are going to get us into trouble. And I say that as a modeler. And let me explain. I'm sorry, it's a long answer. Right now, most places don't have that much renewables on the grid. California, we're an exception, Portugal, et cetera. So if you ramp up to have, you know, have a good ratio of, say, two to one new renewables and storage, you're probably going to do all right. Worrying about what we need when we're at 92% is a fool's errand because we may have a huge hydrogen or an ammonia economy then. We might not. And people who plan for what we're going to need at the end of the transition are missing. We need to transition for worrying about that. And it is hard to tell that story because certain investors only want to be jumping ahead. But what we find here is that, you know, California's grid. We peak at about 51 gigawatts. We import about 10%, and we only have about five gigawatts of storage. We are a super leading edge energy system, and we're about to go to 100% electric vehicles, about meaning over the next decade and a half. So we need a higher number than 10% but we probably aren't gonna need these huge numbers largely because almost everyone who's installing solar today, companies and individuals is being smart and they're installing solar and batteries because that's where the subsidy is. There's no more remaining subsidy here just to do solar. So I've danced around your question a lot of ways. The shortest answer I would say is that in all of those switch models, even when you think about the extreme events, a, a one week cloudy period or this and that, a uh, blackout period, if you diversify your supply, offshore wind plus onshore wind, solar, you probably don't need more than about 25 or 30% of peak generation demand available in storage. Now, what I haven't said is how many hour duration. Clearly four hours is sufficient. I have a N phase 11.2 kilowatt hour battery in my garage. I have two electric vehicles. They have more than 12 times that capacity, but in, in Northern California, vehicle to grid is not yet permitted. We just had a two day blackout and I ran out of power late in the second day because I turned off my hot tub, very Californian. I turned off my refrigerator. Um, and so we struggled through it and made it. So I think getting storage deployed more or less part and parcel with new generation 
is where we should be thinking, not worrying about what's going to happen between 89% renewables and 100%. That's a long way off. And none of us are smart enough, even those who claim they are smart enough, none of us are smart enough to give that answer. Thank you, Dan. I, I, I completely agree with you. So in the near term, as we are deploying new generation capacity, new storage capacity, it's going to be a very interesting interplay between the two. And the one thing that I'm worried about is just overbuilding, say, of manufacturing capacity for battery technologies, right? And that could be a, an, 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 um, a challenge here, especially as one thinks about how to go between battery for transportation and battery for the grid. Yeah. Um, big decisions are being made and how to split resources. Um, any thoughts on that, Dan? Um, oh, Megan, might... I think, has more thoughts on this, but I, I think it's really simple. And that is that if you enable batteries and hydrogen for transportation to be dual use, vehicle to grid with all the inefficiencies, there is no overbuilding. We have, we have human rights issues, we have environmental issues, but we are going to find good uses for all the storage if we don't tie not one arm, right? I mean, like I said, in my house, I have two EVs, a 70 kilowatt hour and a 60 kilowatt hour, and neither one can go into the grid. And yesterday when our power, we were down to the last 5%, you know, like the Ford Lightning, if I had been able to plug my car into my house and send power in, you know, I wouldn't have run out and I would have, I would have watched more Golden State Warriors basketball and more Brit Box mysteries um, but instead, I had to actually read a book. <laughs> well, Dan, at, le at least you had electricity last week. Uh, <laughs> some of us had no electricity at all. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. And look, I am a I am a white male in my 60s living in the Oakland Hills, right? So the entitlement multiplies. And I think that's the real worry. We are not building storage for low-income Bayview, Hunters Point communities. We're not building storage for all kinds of low-income areas. And that's where the Biden Justice 40 is so brilliant. And, you know, I know that some people didn't love Carter's presidency, but we look back on it very fondly. I think no matter what happens going forward, we're going to look back on President Biden as someone who absolutely jump started what we needed to do. Whether we continue or not is our own thing, but he really opened the door for what we need here. Thanks, Dan. And, and Dan, you made this really great point. I think um, maybe also let me uh, ask Megan a way in as well, is having more and diverse use cases for assets makes a lot of sense, right? For example, vehicle to grid is another one. Some of the water treatment, uh, Megan, you talk about. So Megan, can you maybe comment more broadly, maybe as we embrace the energy transition, what are some of the other opportunity we can use assets on the ground in a smarter way to decarbonize rather than say developing two new technologies, manufacturing them, which all have risks uh, associated with them. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think certainly uh, multifunctional asset um, deployment is uh, really, really important. Um, you know, I know the water sector really well. So I, I focused on um, how you can make water assets multifunctional and particularly you know, supporting the electricity grid. But um, it's transportation, um, certainly it, it's manufacturing itself. I mean, all of our chemical manufacturing, food and beverage, pulp and paper, there's a tremendous amount of effort trying to think about how um, to incentivize uh, energy flexibility in the manufacturing sector. And in some ways, that's not a publicly held asset, right? It's a privately held asset, but um, there's still a lot of value in deploying those assets flexibly, especially if your overall production output um, is not sort of temporally constrained. Um, it, you know, if, if you can, if you have more production output than you need, um, can you modulate that, right? Um, so there's there's a tremendous amount of effort right now in chemical manufacturing and in pulp and paper, in steel and in um, cement uh, to really think about energy flexibility there as well. And, you know, I think the water sector, in some ways, the water sector is actually really low hanging fruit from a deployment perspective because um, it's publicly owned. Uh, there's there's real incentive. And it's, I mean, quite frankly, like it's operated by the same public utilities commission at the end of the day. Um, and I think that that incentivizes deployment. Um, 
the the and, and especially experimentation in a way that some of those private sectors are really only going to respond to price signals, right? And so if we're going to see the deployment of those assets, um, there has to be a clear price signal um, lead on that. And I, I can't emphasize enough the degree to which um, that isn't happening today. Like even in California's grid, um, the time of use pricing signals are not actually aligned with the carbon intensity um, of the grid. And it's remarkable. Like if, you know, if I'm optimizing um, Silicon Valley clean water for carbon intensity, I run that system completely differently, right? Um, or uh, Santa Barbara. And I'm getting like effective prices on carbon in the single digit dollar numbers, right? Like I can shed a, a very large amount of carbon um, from my operation which at the end of the day is the goal, right? Like it's not shedding megawatts that we care about necessarily. It's how do we how do we sort of stabilize the grid and supply megawatts where it's needed, but at the lowest carbon intensity possible. And so we often like to look at this on a dollar per uh, ton basis um, in terms of a um, you know effective uh, carbon savings or, or cost savings, carbon savings. And so it's really, really cost effective to do this kind of um, large energy flexibility uh, sort of deployment um, from a dollar per ton basis of carbon. Megan, let me build on this a little bit too, and, and, and please uh, also weigh in, yeah. Dan. So you commented on this opportunity for optimization, right, to achieve say the objective of um, uh, um, really maximizing the effect on carbon. So what's missing today? Um, why are we so far from optimal? Um, yeah. Seems to be a well post optimization problem. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I would say um, we are far from optimal. It's not the most well post optimization problem though, because you're not just optimizing for carbon, you are optimizing for resiliency of your grid. Um, and that is highly local and, and very, very, um, uh, yeah, it's just very, very place dependent um, and very grid mix dependent and very weather dependent, right? So it, 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 I mean, functionally, it's just very dynamic. It's both place dependent and highly dynamic. And so it is, um, you know, as academics, we can say, oh yes, that's a well-posed optimization problem. I think in, when you get into the real world, um, it isn't at all. <laughs> um, it's actually really complicated. And, and also, I mean, you know, real-time electricity prices um, are really hard to plan around. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant operator, you know, again, coming back to my industry, they don't want real-time dynamic prices because how are they supposed to run their facility in a like reliable, cost-effective way when it's completely uncertain um, what the price of electricity is in the next minute? So that doesn't work either, right? But I do think that... Um, I mean, I don't want to be so negative, uh, but, but I think there's a lot of challenges um, from uh, both the, uh, you know, both an optimization perspective because of the temporal and the spatial variability, but there's also real challenges from the human dimension of, um, you know, how do you provide enough price reliability so that um, the rest of your economy can function? I think that's right. I mean, it, it, it isn't a simple optimization. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of aspects that make it challenging when you think about oh let's optimize the amount of electricity and the amount of storage that sounds well posed and I mean that's why we build models like switch yeah. but you know California right now is for example grappling with this huge debate over the Colorado River um, it dramatically changed the near term numbers even if we all suspect that this has to go over time. Um, we have the challenges of rebuilding communities like Paradise. These are not small isolated cases. They depend on how much utilities are going to either decide or be forced to invest in hardening transmission. The utilities are quite fairly feel that they do not get credit or and they can't get revenue out of certain things they do like what you and I, I think would probably say is natural. And that is everyone who has a smart meter which you need to have solar, should also be able to put your energy storage from your vehicle to grid in. So, and 
those are not small numbers. And California probably has 11 gigawatts of solar behind the meter. That is a revolution for utilities that are not used to being super leading edge, even though we have pretty good utilities here. Almost everyone in California complains about them. So it is a hard story. I think the biggest part of this is that what we have not done, politically, not technically, is to incentivize utilities to be knowledge creators. And by that, what I mean is there are individual policies that tried it. My own personal favorite, some people love it, some people hate it, is something called decoupling, where utilities are not paid in some straightforward kilowatt is the same thing. Just when Megan mentioned, why don't we align prices with carbon since that's our state policy? Um, but under decoupling, a utility gets paid an amount where you get paid more per kilowatt hour if you sell less kilowatt hours and you get paid less per kilowatt hour if you say more based on a target that the utility needs to analytically and scientifically set and then the utility and then the regulator, the PUC reviews. And that's a very, very subversive but very clever strategy, not just to reward energy efficiency, but also to reward smart planning. And of course, there's variances that are allowed for extreme weather events like we just had or for changes in population. So it's not like this locks you in, but we don't make our utilities be as smart as possible. And if energy and information are these complex quantities, not doing that does everything Megan said. We, we throw bad split incentives all the time at us. Well, I do think one place that, you know, there is certainly a lot of opportunity to, to continue to do work is understanding how different duration storage and how different types of storage come, come together. Um, there, the number of uh, especially load flexibility options are expanding and are likely to continue to expand as we electrify more things. Um, and yet, you know, I think we there isn't a strong understanding of the value add of deploying those different types of um, energy flexibility or energy storage assets um, after we've undergone that sort of transition. Um, so, you know, certainly cars are, electric cars are like the big gorilla in the room as an example of like a tremendous amount of um, storage that sh should be deployed. Um, but I think there's also a lot of other different types of storage uh, and understanding how we expect different sectors to contribute there and, and how to provide value to those sectors um, is going to be really important in then ultimately figuring out how this whole system works together. Thank you, Megan. Megan and Dan, um, we're at the end of the hour here, and thank you for your talks and contribution. Maybe let me ask one final uh, forward-looking question and get your thoughts. When I think about energy storage, we are playing with a lot of trade-offs. The trade-offs in efficiency, yeah. cost, manufacturability, and so forth. Can I ask each of you to pick one trade-off you would like to see broken? So in terms of innovation and technology, what would be the one trade-off you wish that doesn't exist so we don't have to trade between the two? Do you mean yeah. breaking the laws of physics and, and, <laughs> and civil engineering, or do you mean like political laws? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Neither. Breaking, breaking what is going beyond what's possible today, what future technology can we, can we develop that would have, say, right now, energy storage for the grid you trade between cost and efficiency, right? If you want high efficiency, the cost is high, low efficiency, the cost is large. So, so I'll go first. Um, two things, and I'm working on one of them, so I'm biased. I think actually in the next decade, we are very likely to have space-based solar. It makes huge sense. It then requires no storage. Um, I probably would make an equally firm bet, but a little more than a decade to have uh, fusion not fission. If I were to bet where the future of nuclear is, I think it's going to be uh, light atoms, not heavy ones. Um, but the other thing which I think you could do right away is already on the books, but there's lots of opposition. And that is, it's crazy that we're not using a social cost of carbon. Yeah, Thank well, you, uh, Dan stole mine. I mean, I, I think, I'm you know, sorry. Like said, as I said before, to the degree that which we can 
um, price in uh, th that social cost of carbon and then start to make decisions around that, it's going to incentivize a lot of um, sort of smart deployment of technologies. Um, we, we don't have that today. And so we're, we're all operating on sort of uneven playing fields. Um, the goal is to decarbonize here. Uh, and so I think that that, to the degree to which we can really make that front and center um, in our deployment strategy of technologies and, and evaluate on an equal basis um, that relative value, we, we need that. Dan and Megan, thank you very much for sharing your perspectives on a system level for energy storage, uh, for the grid and beyond, and for the very insightful discussions, many opportunities are ahead, uh, both in uh, more traditional energy storage, but also in unconventional storage, uh, as in the water system that Megan highlighted. Um, again, it's a great pleasure to host uh, both Dan and Megan, and uh, please uh, rejoin us in the spring quarter in a few weeks, as we have a new series of speakers and stay connected with us on social media. Thank you very much for joining us today.